to Leaders of Tomorrow, the only show on Indian television where you, the MSME, get sent to stage. This is ET Now, special daily initiative to give MSMEs and entrepreneurs the opportunity to be front and center on every industry and area that matters to you. Tonight on the show, a panel of experts will answer your questions and later on, on Influencer Tonight, we'll put Hello Curry in focus. Tonight, we have Sunil Gupta, Angel Investor, as well as Anita Belani, CPO and Gacha Capital, answering questions that some of you, our viewers, have sent us. Do stay tuned. At the end of this episode, we'll tell you how you too can send us your questions. Sunil Anita, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, Let's uh, start tonight's show then with our first query and this is an email. Pratik Rathod has sent us this first question tonight and Pratik's question is that they are an online artist search and discovery tool that helps people book the best artists for every event. The issue that they face is as far as cash flows is concerned. Pratik says they have got committed projects, but cash flow is an issue because they have fixed monthly cash outflows, which include payrolls, etc. But their inflows are periodic depending on projects in such a situation. His question for our experts, what is, this, uh, what is advisable? How do they regulate the process of inflows and outflows? The cash flow is a typical problem of a project-based industry because the customer acquisition process is not clear, yeah. the customer delivery is varied, and at the same time, uh, you know, the payment terms for different projects are also different sometimes, you know. So that variableness is always there in the product project business. Now to contain that, what he should do is that uh, he should either take some kind of advance money or mm. do some kind of uh, uh, sinking of his payment cycle with his uh, cycle for paying for the fixed expenses he has. You know. Obviously fixed expenses go on a time, but uh, once he fine tune, if he is not able to do at least he should have a three months working capital so that keeps on rolling and keep a cash flow intact in terms of meeting those obligations of fixed costs. Sure. I, I agree with Sunil when he says, you know, you should take an advance. Also, the payment terms with the uh, artist should be in such a way that you pay the artist once you have received the money. Because what happens is if you're paying them before you have collected, okay. you're overextending yourself and your business will suffer. That's why there's working capital issues. So the payment terms with the artists have to be very clearly, you know, drafted in such a way that you're not paying them before you have collected the money. Pratik, uh, two important tips for you then. One, of course, is look at getting an advance from the artist. And second is don't pay them till you have received the payment. That way you can uh, regulate your income, uh, your inflows as well as your outflows. Thanks for that question. Our next query is an email as well and this one is coming to us from Kushal Trivedi. Kushal has written in to us to say getting tenders or contracts from the government for a business like his, says, he says, is becoming difficult because they have a small revenue even though they have better services than other big leads. Getting these contracts is leading to the small revenue. He says, how do we overcome this? We would like to know if there's any channel or platform or startups like us where they can catch hold of such government tenders or contracts. The good news of working with the government, of course, is that the ticket size is usually larger. But the flip side is that getting those payments becomes difficult. But now there's a specific rule that the government has yeah. mandated, which says that they have to declare what outstanding is there on part of the government projects. A lot of the government projects yeah. have to be done with small businesses. What would you have to say to Kushan? See, if he's a registered startup, then there's a good news is that, you know, now the registered startup has a preference in terms yeah. of uh, bidding for the contract for the large government. Now, if he is not registered startup, then obviously there is a challenge because to participate in the tender, which has large EMD monies and performance guarantees and, sure. and a criteria of a big turnover and a profitability, the only way is to again create an alliance and partnership with some of the firms who can front end that particular project and bid together with them and get it kind of subcontracted for his uh, products and services. Yeah. Sure. Just to add to what Sunil is saying, you know, uh, there are a couple of things that come into play when you are responding to tenders or RFPs from the government. One is, you know, how you price your uh, offering is very important because at the end of the day, it's the L1 process, you know, who's the cheapest will get the, will get the tender. And then in uh, government projects, they also look at uh, what's called the technical capability. Mm. So, you know, and the experience you have with government projects. So you have to detail that out and only if you, you know, in some, I remember in some tenders, you have to have, you have to show at least five to seven years of working with other government projects. 
So it's about you know getting into those smaller projects initially where that requirement is not there and bidding low. Okay. Only then can you get your foot in the door and okay. build that five, seven years of experience which is required for the larger projects. It's very important to do that. That's okay. the only way you can get government projects. Okay. Kushal, uh, that's in response to your question. All the very best then uh, for getting these contracts from government projects. Our next query is uh, a query that's coming to us on our Facebook page. Nikhil Thakri has written in to us and do stay tuned. And the end of the show will tell you all the different ways in which you can reach us if you have any question for our experts. Nikhil Thakri has, said, uh, has sent us this question to say that he's a new age car portal which provides a new level of car shopping experience. The challenge, he says, they face is with regard sales and financing. First, people take time to believe that cars can be sold online and can get, uh, get delivered like any other product. Second, with regards financing, being a startup, he says they don't have much capital. His question for our experts tonight, one, he wants to know how they can change mindset and also how they can get better right. financing, of course. You know, the car buying process have gone through a lot of changes in the last mm. 10 years. Earlier, there was a very simple choice that you have only one or two models available. Mm. Now, there are a plethora of models. There are products, there are different features, there are different pricing segments. And so now the, the car buying process, in, they do a lot of researching. They do a lot of product comparison, which is done mostly online nowadays. You know, The only element which is still remaining is a test drive component, which has to be done physically outside. So, you know, that's the only element he, he cannot avoid at the current moment. But down the line, I'm sure that uh, what is happening in Europe and US is you just buy everything online and you are done with that and your car get delivered. Mm -hmm. But that's still for some time, the test drive component, which is a physical part of the whole process, has to happen on the ground. Sure. In terms of financing, I would say you should go asset light. You should not keep a stock of inventory of the vehicle. You should have a back to back arrangement with the manufacturer or a master distributor okay. and deliver it on demand uh, to the customer rather than buying the stock and, you know, and sure. uh, uh, blocking his finance there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just add to what Sunil said uh, mindsets are changing like they're not changing so it, it's just work in progress and the touch and feel of a product is very important for us even today I want to sit in the car I want to see how it feels I want to drive it so I think he has to facilitate that somehow till we are in a situation where we say I don't really want to do that sure. but I think that's a long you know long ways away yeah. yes the and the other thing on financing he needs to form some alliance with NBFCs that will sure. you know partner with him and do that because he cannot be so, you know, funding these transactions, it's just sure. not practical right. to do that, yeah. Nikhil, that's in response to your question. Thanks very much for sending us that. All right, time for one last question then tonight. Uh, and this one is coming to us from Nawaz Ahmed. Nawaz has tweeted at us to say that uh, his is a boutique consulting firm specialized in writing business plans for existing companies and startups. He says his major challenge is the support of various banks and associations and companies where he says they follow a very orthodox method of looking at companies. Uh, and uh, and the company's turnover and only then are in a position or willing to lend. Apart from that, he says he's applied for an import-export license. It's been over three months, but there's been no information available. How are you supposed to establish a business when the initial setup phase takes an eternity to get everything done? <laughs> well, the, that's the... The, Even though the we have ease, part, yeah, yeah. ease of doing business, we're moving up the yeah. rankings, etc. It's still taking time. It takes time and, you know, export import licenses. I'm sure they take a long, long time to happen, but we really don't have any control over that. You know, for him, it's a consulting business and consulting businesses are difficult, you know, because you are in a, you're supposed to go and sell a service and, you know, you're supposed to come across as a thought leader. So it is a little difficult for him. I think what he needs to do is you know be very clear about his target market be very clear about his proposition be very clear about what he's trying to sell to whom sure. and also you know being very very sure about how he's running his business because you know costs can ex escalate you can give all kinds of payment terms and discounts etc but it's very important to keep uh, you know a tab on how you're running your business so sure. your working capital your metrics your margins etc have to be in focus okay I, you know, well, things have improved, like mm. ease of doing business to some extent. Mm. But uh, if he has created a thorough paperwork and documentation, okay. 
I'm sure a lot of things get uh, you know, uh, mm. uh, result very fast. For example, for import-export license, there's something called IEC code, import-export code, <laughs> which you can do and log into a uh, DGFT site and get it within three days. Okay. Because now even the government has set the performance benchmark for issuing some of these licenses at a specific period. So I don't know why it took three, three months, but if his documentation and things are clear, he can get it in three days also. Yeah. Okay. And it is online. Okay. So uh, things are changing on the ground. It is taking a little bit of time, but if you have all of your paperwork in place, right. then um, there's no reason why it should be taking time is the suggestion of our experts. So do look into that. And uh, we've run out of time on this episode. As always, thank you both very much thank for you. coming thank tonight. You. Time for a break on the other side. Halo Kari is our influencer tonight. Do stay tuned. We'll bring you more on this Hyderabad-based company. Cooks spoil the broth is the saying and that definitely seems to hold true for this Hyderabad based company. Pooja Jain caught up with Halo Curry in Hyderabad to understand how an asset light and a lean delivery model is helping Halo Curry make a difference in the quick service restaurant space. Take a look. Today edtech, medtech, fintech, they're all widely considered to be standalone industries. Is food tech following in their footsteps? So food tech has been a revolution, in fact. 2014, it just uh, started sprouting. And by 2015, I think it has attracted highest amount of attention from who's and who's of the industry. So it, all the VCs, all the institutions were really following it and they were really curious in terms of how is it going to really grow. And food tech has been completely all over India. It has captured the highest of attention ever possible in the industry, in any of the industries that you have point. Well, there have also been a fair number of casualties in the space. So what's Hello Curry doing differently? So casualties is a very scary term to hear. But nevertheless, I think this industry has witnessed highest number of casualties than any industry. As I told previously, I think this food tech industry has attracted a lot, lot much of attention. And also it has witnessed so many deaths because especially when you talk about this food industry is very price sensitive so people are extremely sensitive on the prices so they don't want to spend too much they want to spend about 100 rupees they want to get best out of the best in the world to their home delivered exactly to their bedroom that's exactly the customer's perception so in this understanding and also when you look at the other angle there's so much of crowd so this industry has attracted highest number of entrants too much of crowd in the space and you understand how these complexities arise. When you have 300 people fighting for this 100 rupees versus two, three players fighting for the 100 rupees. The same 100 rupees, it hasn't changed. So customer orders the same food. Now customer has, instead of 10 choices, they have got 150 choices. So essentially the market is growing. People are sharing the space, but as similar to the market growth, there is an incredible amount of growth in terms of entrance. A lot, lot of people enter into this. So that has resulted in uh, too much of casualties. In the food tech space especially, a lot of people were paying a lot of attention to the technology than the real food. That is also three, one of the major causes of why there are so many deaths in this industry than the growths. We are absolutely not an exception, so we just were wounded uh, because of the competition. We were wounded because the same loyal customers has suddenly started migrating to other joints. And then uh, we started implementing, instead of just a standalone isolated dark kitchen, we started converting that into hybrid models. So we are, uh, I think we are, we probably are one among the very few to have implemented the hybrid model, where with the hybrid model, you have a dine-in. It'll not be a lavish dine-in. It's just a small petite dine-in. I think whatever you see, it's a small dine-in. It's a cult example of how a small 500 square foot dine-in, where we also do the delivery. So, you have the continuous uh, flow of revenue that comes from your dining where people walk because they know exactly there's a restaurant, they walk into the restaurant. And at the same time, it is complemented by your delivery. So the delivery, especially the business, goes like this. Just, it's like a wave, too much of spikes and too much of downs. 
So to accommodate that, to balance it out, to level it out, I thought that the hybrid model makes much more sense. On top of the hybrid model, we were started forming the micro entrepreneurs because in this industry, unless until there's a proprietor sitting on top of everything, it's going to be very hard to make a lot of profits. So we converted this into hybrid model. That's the number one step one we have taken, and step two, changing this from corporate owned units to franchisee operated units. So the moment the franchisee guys come in, we give them all the SOPs, all the standards of operating with all, all the hygiene practices. And we also will invite them to be much more innovative. So they come here with a uh, with lot of innovation, which we wouldn't have thought when we are at the corporate. So this has resulted in immediate change from where we were just like a cash burning to perhaps cash, the break even to cash positive. So that has resulted in a greater st um, story for us. Well, on top of the space being highly fragmented, it's also plagued with another very fundamental issue, which is wafer-thin margins. How does the Hello Curry business model accommodate for that? So thin margins is absolutely true. Um, so first of all, to, to do away with these thin margins, you will have to be clearly, first of all, there are a lot of theories about, people talk about when you really attain the scale, you will have much more bargain power where you can get the same ingredients at a lower cost. I think that's okay, but at the end of the day, the moment customers feel that, yes, this is the joint that I go, you always can increase the prices. There is absolutely no problem at all. In order for us to perhaps increase the margins, there are various ways as to how to increase the margins. One of one is fundamentals right. You have to have the fundamentals right. Second is you have to have the lean team. You cannot have too many team members sitting in the kitchen. You will have to operate at a very lean mechanism. The lean mechanism is only possible when the proprietor manages it. So when the corporate manages it, the same 15% that we were uh, having uh, in terms of the overall EBITDA or profitability has suddenly become 23-24% when the proprietor manages it because he knows exactly how many people have to be there in the kitchen. So that has also helped us a little bit in terms of increasing the profitability. And the moment you start clicking uh, in terms of the customer's mind, you can always look at slightly increasing the prices because customers are all loyal to you. Well, you've mentioned customer loyalty, but I've noticed there's been a fair amount of consolidation in this space. And, you know, Hello Curry in particular has been on an acquisition spree between Paratha Post, between 542, etc. So is that an attempt to broaden the menu, to acquire the competition, to scale the business? What are the drivers behind those decisions? I think there are three fundamental factors. If you really look at uh, the acquisition, the philosophy of acquisition is very simple. First of all, you have to have a complementary customer base, number one. Second is a complementary product base. Third is a complementary skill set. I think these are three, look, three ways to look at the acquisition. People are just growing along with you. So I think one way to look at it is, first of all, consolidate everything. You know what, I think you're not going to make any, it's not going to make any big impact. So you just join the players who are just growing a little bit, making some impact. You first of all consolidate. And second, you have, because they would have spent a lot of time in terms of product innovation. That's uh, that's going to be a shortcut for us. When we look at these products, so Parada Post has a brilliant innovation in terms of the uh, stuff for Paratas, which Halokari didn't have. So I, I just back the entire uh, experience and also effort that they've put in for the last uh, several years. So that way at least you know, we have the complementing uh, customer base. So that way it's a, it just, uh, when we are at this level, when we are growing at this level, when we acquire, it just becomes sudden acceleration for the company. I think that's why we look at uh, these uh, acquisitions, uh, perhaps. Well, beyond the franchise model that you've now adopted, uh, Hello Curry has also made the decision to serve budget hotels. The rationale there? I think budget hotels is the, the biggest innovation the food industry has ever seen. And I am very proud that we Hello Curry is the first to have, first of all, understood there is a tremendous amount of market that is open, unexploited, extremely critical, and there is a huge amount of gap. So when you look at uh, all the budget hotels in India, so most of the budget hotels have the kitchens, but again, the same food problem where the problem lies with the people. The proprietor of this hotel, which probably has an inventory of probably 30 rooms, he cannot accommodate all the all the people because he does not know, he does not have a clue in terms of what's there in the kitchen because that is not his core line of business. 
his core line of business is only just about filling his rooms because that's where he makes a profit this is compulsion because whoever gets into the hotel needs the food so that's a compulsion so this is where we recognize the problem when you really get into the hotel there is a lot of unexploited inventory uh, unexploited equipment you just go and take the kitchen and then from the kitchen you serve to the same hotel and also all the neighboring hotels so when you look at uh, the hotel we take the kitchen from the hotel we serve the people and also around 1 km radius we started supplying the food to the uh, to the neighboring hotels too without technology so this is where i am truly thinking i think using this artificial intelligence in terms of how the customers are behaving how their eating habits we can easily adopt the technology to influence the customers much more especially in the budget hotel space because the customers are already there you don't need to worry about the customers okay you have we have a lot of customer acquisition cost right now you talk about all these uh, logistics pairs any business customer acquisition is the most important aspect but in this budget hotels the customers are already there they want the food you have about 40 people staying in that hotel you need to give them the food you need to give them the best food so you address the problem of customer acquisition which actually is the biggest killer in the food space we have completely eradicated we don't have to invest anything on the customer acquisition we don't need to spend on the marketing so it is just about serving the food to these people who are staying in the hotels give them the best food so that's i think that's the best of the best models and also in addition to that we have uh, got the technology back and we come we bought a company called fire 42 so we built a software which also does check in check out and which also integrates the point of sale food point of sale i think using this technology there's a one bill customer gets a notification whenever he orders the food so this way it's a tremendous advantage for all the hotel proprietors tremendous advantage for the for the hello carry because we don't need we don't need to invest in the customer acquisition we don't need to invest in the marketing we don't need to invest in any of the equipment well then how do you view the food pandas the swiggies the zomatos of the world you know do you consider those services to be complementary or competition i think it's a complementary so i would say that uh, food panda swiggy and the zomatos of the world uh, perhaps that more like a logistics the like food logistics because they they go to the restaurant they pick up the food they deliver to the customer there's nothing to do with the food manufacturing so i would not call them as like a food players they are like purely logistics players so when you really look at uh, these bigger players so especially it's very complimenting for us because we are going to sit in their uh, apps from multiple restaurants so i don't see any competition between the these players aggregators food aggregators versus food manufacturers is a sheer difference and lastly what does the future of food tech look like in your view i think food tech is on the edge of incredible growth we have not witnessed so far i think it is just starting it is just starting that's our show tonight if you have any feedback or you too have questions for our experts you can always write in readersoftomorrowtimesgroup.com is our email id you can also tweet at me personally sunanda_j or our official twitter handle lot_et now our facebook page where you can leave questions for us is readers of tomorrow and et now thank you so much for watching have a good night